Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to day one of seven. And I want you to know that um, today's topic, of course, is the over-the-counter market and the NESD and the opening of the maintenance of customer accounts. Tonight, and I say tonight, want you to stay a while, uh, we'll be going into the primary market for how equities go public in Chapter 9 and the underwriting process for equity offerings. And then after we bring that stock public, buying it and selling it and trading it out there in the secondary market, wherever it may be listed, uh, and probably... We'll probably list it in the over-the-counter because that's where we're about to begin. I want to tell you that the New York Stock Exchange is located right half a block from where you're sitting right now at 60 Broad. And the American Stock Exchange was at Trinity Place. An exchange is a physical building where buyers come together to buy and sell and trade securities. But for the next hour, I'm going to be in the over-the-counter marketplace. Our marketplace is an environment of automation. Anywhere there is a system of electronic execution is the over-the-counter market. And so that means in order to understand this marketplace, we're going to have to understand some of the systems that you pre-read last night that facilitate over-the-counter execution where these securities are listed. Are you with me so far? Yes. A yes would be thank you. I really needed that one because I couldn't wait for today. Now, I want you to know something before I begin about the over-the-counter market. I have a word here that's very important for you. And that word is a negotiated marketplace, and here's why. Traders are picking up the phone and contacting one another up and looking to negotiate with one another the terms of a transaction regarding securities that are listed in the over-the-counter market. I mean, one trader might contact another and say, what are you bidding? And the other trader might say, well, what are you offering? And can't you and I negotiate the terms of this trade? That's why any security that's listed in the over-the-counter market is known as a negotiated marketplace because of the way it's transacted, negotiated between traders. Are you with me so far? Yes. I want to first begin by talking about these two words which are very important to you right now called market making or making a market in a security. Now because this is stock week we might as well use the almighty equity as the product of concentration. And so let's talk about uh, if you will Goldman Sachs or Merrill or Lehman under the assumption that they were still in business, if you will. I'm afraid to talk about anybody because I don't know who's in and who's not and who's been acquired, but let's just use uh, Merrill Lynch as an example. Merrill Lynch makes a statement today, a brokerage firm. They say that they would like to make a market in Cisco Systems. I use a stock that we all know, an over-the-counter security, a technology issue listed on the NASDAQ, and I use a firm that we've all heard about before. Now, in order for a firm, and only a firm, uh, to make a market in a security, that means they want to trade that security every single day. Uh, to trade that security every single day out there in the marketplace, which means to buy or sell that security, are you with me so far? Yes. They're going to have to publish a price quote in that stock in order to trade that security at. Are you with me so far? Yes. Every security that I teach you has a two-sided price quote accept options. And we'll talk about that another time. Every security, whether it's a preferred stock, a mutual fund, a variable annuity, an equity, a limited partnership, every security has two prices. A two-sided price quote. It's got a bid price and it's got an offer price. Now the offer price has another name. It's also known as the ask price because that's the price that Mr. Johnson is asked to pay when he wants to purchase the security. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now I'd like you to take some selective notes in your legal pad. When you are buying a security, when your client is looking to purchase a security, he, she must pay the ask price to own that security. The ask price, I said, is also known as the offer price. It's the price that the security is being offered out there for the client to pay when they want to purchase. Are you with me so far? Yes. Mr. Johnson, if you would like to buy Cisco Systems, and it's my pleasure to execute the order for you, please pay the price the security has asked of it for you to pay. When you are buying a security, sit, Series 7, you are going long, L-O-N-G, write it down. To go long is to own. To own is to buy. And you buy at the offer price. Sounds simple enough. And now I'm going to use some financial language as a financial advisor because I want you to speak professionally. When you go out and buy stock, specifically stock, are you with me so far? Yes. You buy shares, are you with me so far? Yes. The word shares are referred to as the position, series 7. You're going out to buy a position in a stock. Regardless of how many shares the client is looking to go long, a position 
is the number of shares that the client will own, whether it's 50 shares, 500 shares, or 1,000 shares. So the word position means shares. To go long is to own, is to buy, and we purchase at the offer price. Are you with me so far? Yes. The price that the client is asked to pay when he wants to purchase a security. When you are buying a security, are you with me so far? Yes. You are Series 7 specifically on stock in the language of equities. You are Series 7 accumulating a position in a stock. Listen to my language. I'm talking to you like a broker right away. To accumulate a position, write the word accumulate. To accumulate a position in a stock is to buy shares. Mr. Johnson, how many shares would you like to accumulate in the position on Cisco Systems? How many shares would you like to go long on that stock? Mr. Johnson, would you want to purchase that stock? Please pay the offer price. The price that security is being offered out there for you to pay to go long the stock. Remember now, when the client buys that stock and he pays the offer price to go long a position in the stock, are you with me so far? Yes. That's going to represent his capital that he's investing. Are you with me so far? Yes. yes. And that's the capital Series 7 that is at risk. Capital risk is the risk of the capital potential loss of his investment. And of course, that's the amount of money he's spending to go long the security. And so, we now are talking about the offer price. And that is the price known as the ask price that the client has to pay to go long a position in the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. See that financial language and how it flows? You're starting to speak now and hear the language uh, professionally of a financial advisor. How many shares do you want to buy of the stock? And that's an unprofessional way to approach it. How many shares would you like to accumulate in the position regarding the stock, Mr. Johnson? He sees, he hears that you are a professional. Are you with me so far? Because I'm going to have you speak like a professional starting right now. And so we always accumulate and go long a position in the security, a stock, buying shares, at the offer price. Please pay the offer price to go long that stock. That's going to represent the client's cost basis, which is the amount of money he's investing to go long. Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Yes. Down the road through short-term trading profits, are you with me so far? You're looking to see a rise in the momentum of this stock's price. After all, that's why you are recommending the buy order today. Are you with me so far? Yes. You're looking to show him appreciation of the potential capital gains that could be generated when you trade his position. Are you with me so far? Yes. And you will always, as the financial advisor, Sell that stock means seven. Liquidate the position. Watch the language. To liquidate the position, the word liquidate means sale. So write the word liquidation down. To liquidate the stock is to sell the position, sell the shares. The word liquidation means sale. And the client always receives the bid price when he sells. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Are you with me so far? Yeah. He pays the offer to go long. He receives the bid price when you liquidate. Now, hopefully, based upon your timing and selection skills, tied to the quality research, based upon this recommendation of a buy today, you're looking to generate and capture a bid price that's higher than the offer price. Because if you can do something like that transactionally, you would show your client a gain. Are you with me so far? Yes. I mean, if he buys that stock at 22 and 5 eighths offer, and you liquidate at 25 and a quarter, you showed him a gain on the transaction. Are you with me so far? So pay the offer price to go long. Receive the bid price when you liquidate. If you can show him and capture a bid price that's higher than the offer, you'll show him a gain on the transaction, and that is what you're in the business of generating. Capital gains for clients and showing them trading profits. For the commission business that you've been working for for more than 216 years in this financial world. Are you with me so far? Yes. Welcome to my street of dreams. We're talking about trading profits, and I promise you right now, every security has two prices. This is your primary focus. You make money for your client, and your client will make money for you. Always make money for him first, or her. Are you with me so far? Yes. So. Every security has two prices. It's got a bid price and it's got an offer price. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Yes. In order for a firm, back to this definition, of, to make a market in a security, it means that Merrill Lynch is making a statement today. They want to come out and trade Cisco systems every single day. Every single day. Well, in order for Merrill Lynch to make a market in a stock, which means to trade that security every single day, they're going to have to publish a price quote into that stock, a bid and offer price that they're willing to stand behind to trade. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so, the market maker, which is the brokerage firm, will submit to NASDAQ today because we're in the over-the-counter market, which is one of the many mainframe systems of electronic execution that you studied about last night of NASDAQ listed securities. The market maker will submit to NASDAQ a firm price quote. Notice I use the word firm, which means this. 
Mr. Johnson contacts Merrill Lynch. Please listen to me. Please look at me. And says, Merrill Lynch, are you making a market in Cisco Systems? Are you trading Cisco Systems as a market maker? Yes, we are. And Merrill Lynch, Mr. Johnson says, what is your firm two-sided bid off a price quote in that stock, Cisco, you are publishing out there for all to see today. And Merrill Lynch says, 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer. There's the two prices. Mr. Johnson, how can we help you? Well, I'm pretty excited about that connector into the mall. I'm really excited about Cisco. It's the only stock on the technology portfolio I don't own. I'm a little liquid right now, and I'd like to buy 500 shares of the stock. Can you execute that order for me? Gladly. Mr. Johnson, in order to buy 500 shares, you have to pay the offer price, and the offer price is 20 and 5 eighths offer. Are you with me so far? Yes. Look at the bid. It's 20 bid. If somebody owned that stock and contacted Merrill Lynch and said, Merrill Lynch, this is Mr. Finkelstein. I own 350 shares of Cisco. I've owned it for about nine months now. Merrill, are you making a market in that stock? Yes, we are. Merrill, what's your firm two-sided bid off a of price quote you are submitting to NASDAQ for all to see that you're standing behind to trade that stock every single day? 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer. How can we help you, Mr. Finkelstein? Well, I need some liquidity, and I'm looking to capture some short-term trading profits. Like I told you, I've owned 350 shares of Cisco for a while now, and I want to liquidate my position. I want to sell a stock. Give me so far. Yes. Can you take that sell order in as a market maker? We're required to take the sell order in as a market maker. And so, therefore, Mr. Finkelstein will sell the stock to Merrill Lynch, and Merrill Lynch will give the client what? 20 bid price for his position per share times the number of shares that are being sold to the, to the market. Are you with me so far? Yes. Pay the offer price to go long and accumulate a position in the stock. I'm speaking to you like a broker. Receive that bid price when you liquidate your position. Are you with me so far? Yes. 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer. So the first part of the definition of making a market in a stock is for a firm to submit, publish, put out there for all to see a firm two-sided bid offer price quote. The price quote, 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer, is a firm price, which means that Merrill Lynch has to stand behind that price that they're publishing out there for all to see. So if somebody calls Merrill Lynch to qualify the word firm for you right now, firm quote, listen to me carefully, and says, your firm two-sided bid off the price quote is 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer? Yes, sir. I'm looking to buy 1,000 shares of the stock. Merrill Lynch has to execute that order and stand behind 20 and 5 eighths offer when clients want to go long and buy the stock. If somebody owned that stock and wants to liquidate the position, Merrill Lynch must give them 20 bid. When, they get caught, when the market maker, Merrill Lynch, gets called on the price that they're publishing out there, they have to stand behind that price quote. That's what the word firm means. They can't change it at the 11th hour and say, I know you see 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer. I know you're looking to accumulate a thousand shares of the stock. I can't execute it for you at 20 and 5 eighths offer. I can do it at 21 and a 16th. They can't change that price quote once they get called on that quote. That's why it's called a firm quote. They have to stand behind that price quote. Are you with me so far? And buy for anybody who wants to go long and accumulate a 20 and 5 eighths offer. Liquidate and give any client the sale proceeds when they want to sell that stock 20 bid. Are you with me? Yes. 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths offer. Firm two-sided price quote. Publish and stand behind and trade that at that firm two-sided bid offer price quote. And the second part of the definition of making a market in the stock is when the firm steps in and stands behind that price quote and buys for anybody who wants to go long, 20 and 5 eighths offer at the offer price, uh, liquidates for any client who wants to sell their position and gives the client 20 bid. Are you with me so far? Yes. At least a minimum series 7 of a round lot in the stock. The definition series 7 of a round lot is 100 shares. That's the minimum number of shares a market maker must trade. 100 shares is a round lot. Anything less than 100 shares, series 7 is called an odd lot. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you with me so far? Yes. Believe me, you don't have to whisper to me. You can trade with me. It's going to be okay because I'm here to help you and there are no stupid questions. Uh, the only thing that gets me nervous is when you don't trade with me. I get real nervous. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah, so let's, let's repeat this definition. It's really a two-pronged part definition of what it means to make a market in a stock. Uh, part number one is that a firm has to submit, publish, and put out there for all to see a firm two-sided bid off a price quote in the stock and stand behind that price. And uh, part of the second part of the definition of making a market buy or sell from anyone to anyone, at least a minimum of 100 shares at that bid price if they want to liquidate or at that offer price if they want to accumulate in 20 and 5 eighths offer. Are you with me so far? So the greater the number of market makers in the stock, 
And Cisco has at least six market makers, six firms like Merrill Lynch, publishing and putting out there for all to see their firm two-sided bid off a price quote, agreeing to buy or sell at least a minimum of 100 shares at that firm bid or at that firm offer price. Therefore, and as a result, the greater the number of market makers in the same stock, the greater the trading volume, the greater the activity, the greater the liquidity of the stock's price. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. This thing is going to build into a steamroll that you're not going to believe. I need you to stay with me. Are you with me? Yes. I just said that the greater the number of firms publishing that firm two-sided bid off a price quote in that stock, and they have to agree to trade at least 100 shares at that firm bid or at that firm offer price to anybody who wants to buy or sell that security. Are you with me so far? Yes. And that's got to mean that the greater the trading volume. Are you with me so far? Because more firms are publishing their firm two-sided price quote out there for all to see and agreeing to trade at that price. Are you with me so far? Yes. Whatever their prices might be, are surrounding 20 bid by 20 and 5 eighths off. They'll all be pretty close together in their prices. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so that means that the greater the number of market makers, I'll say it again, the greater the trading volume, the greater the trading volume, the greater the liquidity of the stock's price. Are you with me so far? Yes. I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to sit there and trade with me and look. I have two stocks I want to show you. The first stock is called GHII. Four symbols on the stock is NASDAQ listings. Three symbols on the stock is New York Stock Exchange listings. Things. Let's take a look at this stock. This stock right now is trading at 18 by a half. Watch my language. I said 18 by a half. The first number is always the bid. The second number is always the offer. And how come I didn't say 18 by 18 and a half offer? Because if the second whole number is the same as the first, are you with me so far? Yes. You drop its verbiage because we speak quick in trading. Some, if the trader called me up right now and said, you making a market in that stock? Yes. What's your firm two-sided? I would say 18 by a half. Let's negotiate. What would you like to do? Are you looking to accumulate or are you looking to liquidate? Are you with me so far? Yes. We're already into the trade. Are you with me so far? Yes. We're already into the trade. Are you with me? Yes. It's a wonderful you talk like a financial advisor because it makes sense. Now, take a look. What is the price that the client pays to go along an accumulated position in that stock known as? Right here. I know it's the offer. Give me the price. Can't hear you. There's your price quote into that stock. 18 by a half. Are you with me so far? There's your bid, there's your offer. What is the price that the client pays to go along that stock? 18 and a half. Client calls up and he wants to buy that stock. He wants to buy 5,000 shares of that stock. You execute the order and buy him 5,000 shares at 18 and a half offer. Done! Are you with me? Yes. When the bid is at 18. The bid price, the amount of money the client receives when he sells his stock. Are you with me so far? Yeah. This is at the point of purchase. The client is buying and going along that stock. He's paying 18 and a half offer. Am I right? Yeah. When the bid is at 18, which means what mathematically? Which means that going into this investment, buying 5,000 shares of that stock at 18 and a half offer when the bid is at 18, the client's going into this investment down 50 cents per share on his investment. Am I right? Yes. Why would anybody do something like that? Watch what I just said to you. Listen to what I'm saying to you. If that stock price is unchanged, are you with me so far? Yes. And he said to you, for example, I want you to know I have a short-term trading mentality and approach to the market. I don't hold stocks too long. One or two days. I want in, I want out. Regardless of the performance of the stock price, at tomorrow morning at 9.31, I want you to liquidate my position. What happens if the stock closes at this price? That means you sell that stock tomorrow morning at 9.31 at the open and capture 18 bid, he loses 50 cents per share. Forget about the actual liquidation tomorrow at 9.31. Are you with me so far? At the point of purchase, when he buys 5,000 shares of his stock at 18 and a half offer, when the bid is at 18, he's going into this investment down 50 cents per share. Am I right? Yes. Why would anybody buy anything? Going into the investment down on the investment at the point of purchase. That's the question. You don't have to raise your hands. I mean, we're going to trade. Here's an open forum. Well, obviously, it's based on the stock price rising. Right. We always buy undervalued today. Securities are priced undervalued always. That bid is always lower than that offer. Always. Why? To reflect the potential of the undervalued potential appreciation of that stock price looking to capture the rising momentum of capturing a bid price that's higher than the offer. Are you with me so far? Because anything that you liquidate above 18 and a half offer is a gain to the client. 
line, am I right? Yes. So why do we go in and buy securities when we're down on our investment? Because securities are always priced Series 7 undervalued. The bid is always lower than the offer to reflect the potential of the appreciation of hopefully capturing a bid price that is above that offer price at the time of liquidation uh, to reflect the potential capital gains in trading. Are you with me so far? That's why we have no problem buying in undervalued today for the potential gains tomorrow. Are you with me? Yes. I'll say it again. I don't want you to look at him. I want you to look at me. I want you to ask me because I'm here to answer you. Securities, look up. I'll show you again. Are always priced undervalued. The bid is always lower than the offer uh, because we go in buying at the point of purchase undervalued on our investment, down on our investment to reflect hopefully the potential. This is why securities are priced undervalued of the potential rising momentum, which is why we're buying that stock today and we're bullish, that will eventually hope to capture short-term and or long-term and holding period on trading a bid price that's above that offer to show the client a gain. Am I right? Yes. Now I want you to take a look at something. We're talking about liquidity of stock pricing. Are you with me? Yes. The spread in the security, the spread in the stock, are you with me so far, is the difference between the bid and the offer price. And what is the spread in that stock? I can't hear you. I don't want you to say 50 cents. I don't want you to say a half because it's mathematically incorrect. And in this room, I want you to speak correct. You need to tell me 50 cents per share. Are you with me so far? You're not at the point of liberty to edit out language. I don't want you to edit out anything. Are you with me so far? Yes. It's only going to create a significant and severe problem for you educationally. Everything on Wall Street is quantified on a per share basis. Earnings per share, gain per share, loss per share, cost basis per share. Are you with me so far? Or spread per share in the stock. The spread on a per share basis in this stock is 50 cents per share. Now what does the spread reflect? The difference between the buy price and the sell price. Are you with me so far? Yes. I'm begging you to look at this. I am really begging you to look at this. Would you suggest to me right now, based upon 18 by a half, the stock price, that the price that the client pays to accumulate a position in the stock, which is 18 and a half offer, is very close to a price that this same client might receive when he gave you an order to liquidate. Are you with me so far? Yes. At 18 bid? Yes. The answer is yes. This is considered to be what is known as, in the stock price world, a narrow spread in the stock. A narrow spread is when that bid and that offer are very close together. Now the question becomes, why would the spread in the stock be so narrow? Why might that occur? Well, it's based upon you're dealing with a very strong market for this stock. Why? If the buy price, which is the price the client pays to go long and accumulate the position in the stock, 18 and a half off, is very close to a price that that same client might receive when he gave you an order of liquidation, as in the case, or you would be so far of this particular stock's price, it means that if the buy price and the sell price are very close together, the potential, the potential for generating a capital gain, the probability of capturing a bid price that is above that offer, if not close to that offer, is great. Am I right? right. Which means that the degree of capital risk is small. But the probabilities of potential capital gains are great. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so what are you dealing with right now? You're dealing with a stock whose price is liquid. Are you with me so far? Yes. The definition of stock price liquidity is when the spread in the stock set trades within a narrow range. When the price he pays to go along and buy that stock is very close to a price that that same client would receive when he sells, that means that the probability of a potential capital gain exists is great. Am I right? And the probability of potential capital losses and go down. Are you with me so far? The probability of capturing 18 or above 18 and a half is pretty great on the rising potential momentum of buying a stock with a narrow spread. That's got to mean that there is a very strong market for this stock. A strength in the market is determined by the trading volume. Are you with me so far? Yes. That, that stock right here, look up, probably trades 1.47 million shares a day. Tremendously heavily traded market for the stock. That activity, that heavily trading volume, are you with me so far? Yes. Is based upon one criteria. What is it? Market makers in the stock. The greater the number of firms submitting their firm two-sided bid offer price quote into that stock, the greater the trading volume, the greater the activity in the stock's price, the stronger the market for the stock, the narrower the spread, the potential for capital gains is great, and the lower degree of capital risk. Are you with me so far? Yes. All that represented by the narrow spread in that stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. So the fact that you see a stock without knowing much about that company that trades within a narrow spread, are you with me so far? 18 by a half, like this particular price right here, means that the probability of you capturing a bid price at liquidation that's um, higher than that offer is pretty great. Are you with me so far? Yes. 
when we look at probabilities. And the probability of capturing a bid price that's below that offer is really not that great because the stock is trading very close together. That means that the price that the client pays to go long, the offer price is very close to a price that that same client would receive when he gave you an order of liquidation because you're dealing with high levels of liquidity and a strong market for the stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. When I shook your hand and I looked into your eyes and I take your career on and I take it very seriously and I'm really excited about this education because you're going to get one like you're not going to believe because I have 25 years of experience coming right at you right now. I knew that you had for some brief moment this Hollywood impression of Wall Street still to this day. I'm going to prove it to you right now. How many in this room saw the movie Wall Street? It's a great movie. Michael Douglas who played Gordon Gecko, who I knew when I started out in this business in 79, who was a mover and a shaker and a uh, corporate raider, if you will, that raided companies. Of course, he raided those companies and got convicted of insider trading in the day in the life of the 80s of insider trading. The Wall Street Journal loves Blue Star. Just saw the movie, not the other day. Charlie Sheen played a good young stockbroker co-calling to try to build a business. If you've ever seen it, it's pretty great. Uh, but uh, how many of you in the room saw the movie Boiler Room? I knew it. I just, I knew it. I just, because you have that Hollywood look about you, you know, and I can tell. And that was a day in the life of the genre of the 70s. When I started in the industry, in the 70s, we were dealing with high levels of illiquidity, of stocks that had spreads just like... A, B, C, D. Look at the spread in that stock. This stock right now is trading to you at 19 bid by 25 and a quarter offer. What is the spread in that stock on a per share basis? I can't hear you. Thank you for saying per share. I really appreciate that a lot. You have no idea what that really means to me. Six and a quarter per share. What's this? Capital risk. Capital risk. The client's going into this investment down $6.25 per share in his investment. The price of accumulation is 25 and a quarter offer when the bid is at 19. Look, even if this stock price rises based upon net buying, which drives stock prices up, are you with me so far? The spread in that stock is not going to narrow because you're lucky if that stock trades 2,000 shares a day. You're dealing with high levels of illiquidity based upon the widespread in that stock. The price that that client pays to accumulate a position in that stock is very far from a price that that same client would receive when he gave you an order for liquidation at the bid. Are you with me so far? Yes. Because you're dealing with a weak market for that stock. Not many uh, shares traded in that stock, not much market making, not much activity. And just by looking at the spread in the stock, you can determine the level of illiquidity and rate and rank the potential degree of capital risk and or capital gains. Series 7. Stocks that trade with wide spreads reflect high degrees of capital risk and high levels of illiquidity. Because you're dealing with a weak infrastructure in the market with respect to their trading activity based upon low levels of market making and uh, uh, a low level of activity. Are you with me so far? Yes. So we can just see by the spread in the stock if we're dealing with a liquid stock versus an illiquid stock. And I can assure you right now, ABCD is an illiquid stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. Going into this investment and accumulating a position of 25 and a quarter offer, the client is, of course, uh, looking at a bid price at the time that he buys the stock at 25 and a quarter and offer with a bid at 19 going in at a $6.25 per share capital risk of the potential capital loss in the investment. Are you with me so far? Yes. If there's anything you don't understand, you don't have to blink. You just have to ask me. I'll preempt the, the, the answer anyway. Are you with me? Yes. Because I'm here for you. I'm here to educate you and you're going to get one. So. I wanted your first day of training to be exciting today, so I want to tell you what I did. I called up a couple of traders who are colleagues of mine, and I asked about this stock, which is an exciting stock that's known as a millennium stock called Zytel. Four symbols on the stock NASDAQ listings. We're in NASDAQ all day today. Are you with me so far? Yes. There are four market makers in the stock. I first want to tell you why this stock is called a millennium security. Because um, if you remember the year of 1999, just come on back with me just for a minute. We were getting some concerns at the beginning of the year that there were certain systems of automation in the private sector that would not roll to 2000 when that ball dropped and the new millennium came, but rather they would roll back to 1900. Are you with me so far? We call those problems in the automated industry Y2K compliance concerns. Are you with me so far? Of course, if a system did not roll ahead from 1999 to 2000, roll back to 1900, that meant that that system of automation would break down. And we felt 
There could be problems regarding the medical industry that was fully automated, even problems on our exchange regarding the execution, if our systems of electronic execution would break down. Problems in every sector because we're in a completely automated and digital economy. Are you with me so far? So we started to buy, at the beginning of the year of 1999, what were called millennium stocks. You know, we'll ride any wave down here. That's what's pretty exciting about this industry. Are you with me so far? DDMI, stock number one, and Zytel are known as millennium stocks because these two particular companies happen to have the Y2K technological expertise to be able to handle any Y2K automated concerns. Are you with me so far? Yes. They basically, in English, would fix those systems that would not roll back, uh, that would not roll forward, that would roll back to 1900 so there wouldn't be any of those problems. The stronger of the two millennium stocks, was Zytel because they were awarded the contracts for all of the exchanges. So that meant that they were going to get a tremendous amount of revenue. At the time, the stock was trading at an average of about 16 and 5 eighths a share. Are you with me so far? Yes. With the awarding of the contracts of the uh, major exchanges that we have in our industry to handle any of those exchange Y2K concerns, we felt that that increased potential revenue would increase the earnings and the stock was automatically brought to a high of almost 120 a share at its height at the B. Uh, by the third quarter of uh, 1999, just before that ball drops. So you with me so far? Yes. Of the year 2000. And then, of course, uh, what happened when uh, November came along was we started to sell the stock and no longer want to own it, capitalizing on its high as a result of the impending millennium. Are you with me so far? Yes. Because the positions that we accumulate today are the trading profits that we generate tomorrow. Are you with me so far? Yes. And, of course, what did happen in Times Square when that ball dropped? Not a glitch anywhere to be found in any sector regarding any system of electronic execution. Are you with me so far? And that's when the stock got shorted and got crushed and came humbling down to now trade in its average trading range relative to its profit picture. Are you with me so far? Yes. There are four market makers in the stock. Market maker number one submits to the market today, it's firm, two-sided bid off a price quote to trade that stock every single day. 16 and 7 eighths by 17 and an eighth offer. Market maker number two, 17 by an eighth. Watch the trade. Look here. Forget the notes. Market maker number three, 16 and three quarter bid by 17 and a quarter offer. And market maker number four, 16 and three quarter bid by 17 and an eighth offer. Four market makers in the stock trading that stock every single day, publishing their firm two side bid off of price quotes, agreeing to buy or sell from anybody who wants to accumulate or liquidate the position in the stock. Are you with me so far? At least a minimum round out of 100 shares and or more. Agreed. Agreed. Yes? Yes. This is what we know. Now, before I want you to keep those prices right there because I'm going to come back to them. I want, you to talk, I want to talk to you about the first system of electronic execution in the over-the-counter market. I know where every one of you work. I know where every one of you sit. Are you with me so far? Yes. And surrounding where you sit are the systems of electronic execution. Those systems that you see in the screens right by where you sit that have the price quotes, are you with me so far, yes. uh, uh, is the NASDAQ system. The first mainframe system in the over-the-counter market is called the NASDAQ system. Stands for the National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. National Association of Securities Dealers Automated Quotation System. This is the system, the mainframe system in the over-the-counter market that facilitates over-the-counter execution. In that system, the NASDAQ system, are the prices and the trading volume of NASDAQ securities, securities that are listed on the NASDAQ. Are you with me so far? Yes. With me? Yes. I'm feeling pretty good about you today because I think you are. Now, for every system, for every security, I should say, that's in that system, are you with me so far? Yes. You, as the financial advisor of record, have the capacity to retrieve, to retrieve three levels or three sources of information regarding every NASDAQ listed stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. Before I get into those levels, levels one, two, and three of information regarding every NASDAQ listed stock that you have the capacity to retrieve, levels of information, I want to first talk to you about the requirements that a company must meet in order to be traded and listed on the NASDAQ. Are you with me so far? Yes. Requirement number one, series seven, bullet one. The company has to maintain a certain level of sales and earnings. So there has to be a certain profit picture. The actual specific sales and earnings requirements are not on NASDAQ Series 7 exam, but you, we should know that they have to have a certain level of profitability in order to be um, listed on the NASDAQ. Are you with me? Yes. Requirement number two, Series 7, sales and earnings. Requirement number two, 
The company that wants to be NASDAQ traded, listed on the NASDAQ and traded on the NASDAQ, the company has to retain the services of Series 7, a minimum of three market makers in the stock. Seven! Three firms like Merrill Lynch, who will agree to publish their firm two-sided bid off of price quotes in that stock, in that company, in order to, for that company to be listed on the NASDAQ. Are you with me so far? Three market makers, three firms to trade that stock every single day. The company has to maintain a certain level of sales and earnings. And uh, with that being the case, the initial pricing of this stock when it opens up for trading on the NASDAQ is Series 7, $3 a share. So NASDAQ stocks are $3 stocks because their initial price is $3 a share. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yes. Also, the company that's traded on the NASDAQ may never fall below Series 7, $1 a share on the bid. It's initially priced at $3 a share. The stock could never fall below a dollar a share on the bid. That dollar a share on the bid is called the NASDAQ minimum initial bid test. So it can't fall below a dollar a share on the bid. It's initially priced at $3 a share. The company has to maintain a certain level of sales and earnings. It's got to retain the services of at least three market makers in that stock. And if all of that criteria is met, look at me. The company is NASDAQ listed and NASDAQ traded. Are you with me so far? Yes. Good. Here's your system. Look at me. I'm looking at Cisco right now on that system. And I punch in Cisco symbol, CSCO, watch me, look at me. And I hit level one. The first level of information that you have the capacity to retrieve regarding every stock that's NASDAQ listed is called the inside market price on the stock. Now the definition of the inside market price is known as the best price that's put out there by that one market maker concerning their firm two-sided bid off a price quote amongst many other prices by many other market makers. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now here's why the inside market price is known as the best price. Look at the definition of the inside market price for any security. The inside market price is defined by and represented by Series 7, the highest bid and the lowest offer in that stock. Published by that one market maker amongst many price quotes, amongst many market makers that are all publishing their firm two-sided bid offer price quotes uh, to the system on that particular day. Now watch this more closely and more acutely. <coughs> uh, yes, okay, I'm gonna repeat it for you. Watch this, I didn't say high bid. These two components represent the definition of the best price that's put out there on the street. Highest bid and lowest offer. By that one market maker, there's only going to be one market maker amongst, if there's six or seven market makers publishing their two-sided price quotes out there for the street to, treat, to see, there's only going to be one market maker who at any one point in time in the trading day is at the inside market price. Now let's see why this defines the best price, whether a client is buying or selling. Are you with me so far? Yes. Let's take a look at that part of the definition of the inside market called the lowest offer. I didn't say low offer, I said lowest offer. Now what does the lowest offer price mean to you? Do you think now, with a 20 minute discussion on bid and offer prices, you should be able to qualify for me and you think that you can, what the lowest offer price means? What does the lowest offer price mean? What does that mean? The I'm sorry, he said, this gentleman right here, your name sir? John. Thank you, John. Uh, John is technically correct. What did John say? Uh, the lowest amount that you pay for the stock. Is that what you said, John? Right. And that's how he's... Right. Push it. Thank you, John. That's how he speaks. The uneducated, unsophisticated investor. Now, you're not wrong, but I don't like the way you said it. Now, I'm going to show you how to speak, because I've been speaking to you this way for 20 minutes, and that's okay. I'm going to, however, pull out my Stradivarius. Here's my Stradivarius. Yes, you didn't know I played Stradivarius, did you? The lowest offer price is the lowest price of accumulation when the client goes long a position in the stock. I just said the same thing that you just said, but I spoke like a financial advisor and a professional. You're right. It's the lowest price that the client pays the stock at, if you want to start talking real slang. It's the lowest price that you pay for the stock when you want to buy it. Yeah, you're right. But how about saying it this way? The lowest price of accumulation of your long position in the stock. It sounds much more powerful that way. You see, he's going to give you $100,000 or $250,000 of his assets when he has the confidence in you regarding your knowledge of the markets, the way you speak, your timing and selection skills, and the trading profits that you generate. And he's not going to give you that kind of money when you speak that way. So I want you to start talking like a financial advisor. But you are right. 
representing the client's cost basis. Are you with me so far, which is the capital investment of the capital risk. The offer price is the lowest possible price that your client can pay when he accumulates a position in the stock. Doesn't that sound much better? Mr. Johnson, you want to buy that stock? The lowest possible price that you can pay on the street of dreams right now is XYZ price. You can't buy that stock for anything lower than that price. Are you with me so far? When you accumulate a position in the stock. So on the buy side, are you with me so far? When the client goes long a position in the stock, that's the best price. Am I right? Yes. Good. Look at the other part of the definition of the inside market price into the stock. It's called the highest bid price part of that firm two-sided quote. Now, what does the highest bid mean? Let's see if you can say it to me like a professional. Highest bid means to you what? That's the price that what? Why don't we start it out with that? That's the price that what? Thank you. That's all you're going to say is one word, liquidation? <laughs> you got off easy. The highest bid price is the max amount of money the client receives when he liquidates his position on the sales side. Are you with me so far? Again, that Stradivarius has to come out. So that's the most amount of money the client can receive when he sells his long position. Are you with me so far? Are you with me so far? Yes. Look, whether your client is accumulating or liquidating, whether he's buying or selling, the lowest possible price you can pay you when you want to go long that stock is the best price on the buy side. The most amount of money you can receive when you liquidate your long position on the sales side is the best price. That is why these two components represent the best price. I'm back at the NASDAQ system now. Watch me. I punch in Cisco. And I hit Cisco Systems, right? CSCO, and I hit level one. Level one is going to give you the best price. So that when you're on the phone with your client, watch me now. Look up here. And you start out with your negotiation with your client. What would you like to do, Mr. Johnson? Are we buying? Are we accumulating? Are we liquidating? Are we selling? You begin with the best price, whether he's buying or selling. Are you with me so far? Yes. There are four market makers in the Zytel. There's only one market maker right now who's at the inside market price in that stock. Is it market maker one, two, three, or four? Go! You don't trade with me, you lose. You trade with me, you win. It's as simple as that. One market maker up here right now is at the inside market. Whether your client wants to accumulate or liquidate, you're at the best price right now. Which market maker is it? Say it! Speak! It's okay if you got the wrong answer. That's what training is all about. Say it. The second. Correct. Market maker number two. You need more confidence. You were right. I saw you do it. I read sign language. Only market maker number two right now is at the inside market price in that stock. So if you hit Zytel, are you with me so far? And you are you with me? So, don't nod to me. You're going to be brokers. I want to trade with you. I'm excited. I waited ten days for you. Are you with me so far? So you can get ready for this. Are you with me? Yes. You hit Zytel level one. I want to tell you what level one is going to do. It's going to wipe out the quotes of market makers one, three, and four and only allow you to begin in your negotiation with your client with the best price whether he wants to buy or sell. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Johnson, right now I'm at the inside price on Zytel, the stock that we all know and love and you're very interested in. With my due diligence, I want you to know that the lowest possible price you can pay to accumulate a position that stock is 17 and 8 offer. Mr. Johnson, if you're long that stock and you want to liquidate your position for trading profits today, the most amount of money you can get on the street of dreams is 17 bid. What would you like to do? Are you with me? Ah, yes. oh, it's exciting. So we, we see what level one really represents. The best price. You start out with the best price in your negotiation with your client. Are you with me so far? Yes. He said, okay, 17 by an ace. That's the best price, whether I'm accumulating or liquidating. <laughs> Correct, Mr. Johnson. Just before we go forward, and I'm looking to go long, 5,000 shares into the stock. I love it. I've done my due diligence. You've educated to me that 17 and 8 is the lowest possible price. Just before we buy that stock. I can't buy that price for any, I can't buy that stock for any lower than 17 and 8. Am I right? You're right, Mr. Johnson. It's the lowest possible price. And if you own that stock, the most amount of money you can get on a per share basis is 17 bid. I got it. Lowest possible price. I'm looking to buy 5,000 shares, 17 and 8th offer. Yeah, uh, I, but I am an aficionado for trading volume. I'd like to get an idea of what the activity is in the stock. Boom! Cisco, level 2. Level 2, series 7, repeats the inside price. Look, before you write, because I figured it out already. You can't write and listen to me at the same time, so I don't want you to do both. Look up. It's okay. I got you. I'm doing this 20 years. It repeats this price, and it gives you another criteria that level one does not give you. Set size. Size is the number of shares that are traded into the stock. So what does level two give you? A repeat of the inside price, 17 by an eighth, and it will also give you size, which is the number of shares traded in the particular stock. So if you hit Cisco and you hit level two, are you with me so far? Yes. What happens if you see that price again and then you furthermore see, are you with me so far, at a one o'clock in the afternoon today, 1.27 million shares traded in the stock. 
Mr. Johnson, I'm an aficionado for trading volume as well because it tends to lead to a performance in the trend of the stock's price. Right now, relative to your request, there's 1.27 million shares traded in that stock at 1 o'clock today with four and three and a half hours left remaining to the close. However, do you realize, Mr. Johnson, that yesterday, 24 hours earlier, at the same exact time at 1 o'clock, there was only 657,000 shares traded into this particular stock. Almost double the amount of shares traded in this particular stock regarding a tremendous amount of buying coming into the market into Zytel 24 hours later, probably because the company came out with positive earnings expectations that are going to beat Wall Street Street of Dreams. You're looking at this particular price right now and you're looking at the lowest offer price of 17 and 8th offer and I got to tell you right now, a price you might not see for a while relative to the double the amount of shares that are traded 24 hours later. Instead of picking up 5,000 shares in the stock, I want you to pick up 50,000 shares in the stock and that's why, that because that significant trading volume is going to blow up the performance of the stock's price. What am I doing right now? Does it sound like I am educating him? Yes or no? Yes. The answer is no. There's a big difference between giving him information on a company and asking him to go from 5,000 to a buy of 50,000 shares of the stock because of the double the trading volume, the capitalize on the price. He's not going to see you again for the next six months. I'm going for the close. Ladies and gentlemen, that's sales. Remember, I'm a broker. Give me the phone. Let me at him. Give me the, give me the, give me the phone. Let me at him. There's a big difference. I asked him to go from 5,000 shares to 50,000 shares on the double the amount of trading volume based upon a stock price that he's not going to see you again for a while because of a positive earnings report that's going to blow up the performance of the stock's price. Big difference between sales and just giving the client information on the company. Are you with me so far? Yeah, yes. That's all right. You'll recognize the salesman because he's going to keep coming out of you every single time because I can't change. But there is the proactive relationship underlying the Series 7 training program like I promised you with a real sales training program built into these strategies and fine points. Are you with me so far? And just maybe you not only be licensed if you do the work with me, you understand what it means to be a fiduciary. Because you're looking at one for 25 years. For Christ's sake, it's a quarter of a century. Just come along and trade with me. It'll be exciting for you. Are you with me? I promise. I'm dedicated to you. Are you with me? Yes. Don't worry, I'm not leaving. I never really go too far. Well, level three you don't have access to. This is only found in the trading department of the brokerage firm. Here's why. Because in the trading department of the brokerage firm, they see all the transactions. And the transactions are associated with the buys or the sells. And so when you write up your buy ticket, or when you write up your sell ticket, which I want to show you uh, at the break, those trading tickets go into the trading department of the firm. Am I right? When you want to buy 350 shares of Qualcomm, you want to sell 500 shares of GE, after the compliance department approves the trade to ensure that the client is suitable for the transaction, liquid for the transaction, management approves it, compliance approves it, where does the, the ticket go? The ticket goes into the trading department of the firm. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, and what does that trader do? Well, he's going to go out there and either buy or sell that stock for you, for your client, get the best possible price of execution to buy or sell, depending upon whether your client wants to buy or sell, and he's going to go to the proper location the secondary market where the security is listed. He's going to go to the Chicago Stock Exchange, New York, Amex, NASDAQ. He's going to go to the Boston, the Cincinnati, or the Pacific Exchange if the securities are listed on some of our regional exchanges. He's going to go out there in the marketplace and in 17 seconds he's going to execute that order. And for listed stocks in 90 seconds from the trade, then that trade is reported to the consolidated ticker tape that the trade was done. Are you with me so far? Yes. This date that the transaction was facilitated and executed is called the trade date. Are you with me so far? Yes. The date that the client authorized the transaction. So what does the trading department see? The buying and the selling activity in the security because they're executing the order for you for your client. Are you with me so far? Yes. Isn't that what the trader is doing? Traders don't have clients. You have clients. Traders are going out there to execute the order for you for your client. Are you with me so far? Yes. So what happens if over the last 50, uh, 15 minutes trading sees heavy buying coming into the stock versus selling? Maybe they see over the last 15 minutes uh, 50,000 shares are being purchased in that stock versus 25,000 shares are being sold in that stock. That represents a net uh, buy of 25,000 shares in that stock. The word net is the difference between the buy and the sell side. If 50,000 shares are purchased in that stock over the last 15 minutes versus 25,000 shares were sold in that stock over the last 15 minutes, there are more people buying that stock than selling that stock by 25,000 shares on the buy side. Are you with me so far? Yes. This is called seven, net buying. Net buying was greater, greater buying than selling. More buying than selling. The net is the difference and the differential between the buy and the sell side. 
So what do you think the trader and the market maker is going to do regarding the price quote in that stock if they see net buying? Look at me, I'll show you. They're going to raise up that bid offer price. Am I right? Because buying does what? Buying, buying a security kind of maintains stock price equilibrium. Maintaining it where it is. It is only when there is net buying, which is greater buying than selling, does it drive stock prices up. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so, what happens if they see net selling? More selling than buying in that stock over the last hour. Are you with me so far? Yes. What do you think the market maker, which is the firm, going to do? They're going to enter the NASDAQ system through that source of information called level three and drop that bid offer price because when there's greater selling than buying, stock prices go down. Are you with me so far? Yes. The level three source of information regarding every NASDAQ listed stock allows the market maker, which is the firm, to enter the NASDAQ system. How do you gain access to enter the NASDAQ system? Through a level three source of information, which is why you don't see that level because it's only found in the trading department. Are you with me so far? Yes. Which allows the market maker, which is the firm, to enter the system to change that firm two-sided bid offer price price quote, dropping it if there's net selling or raising it if there's net buying as many times as deemed necessary throughout the trading day uh, based upon buying and selling and trading activity based upon the forces of supply and demand. Every stock that's listed on the NASDAQ has three levels of information. Level one, the inside, best price. Level two, the inside and size. And level three, it allows the market maker, Merrill Lynch, to enter the NASDAQ system through a level three source of access of information to change their firm two-sided price quote in that stock that they're publishing on a continuous basis. That quote that they're publishing out there is a continuous quote every single day. Standing behind, buying or selling that stock at at least the minimum round lot at that firm bid or at that firm offer price. So they can change that price as many times as they deem necessary throughout the trading day based upon net buying and net selling. So when you see a market make a change their price on the stock, it's because there was either net buying and net selling into the stock over the course of the trading day. Are you with me so far? Yes. So now the next system of electronic execution is called the NASDAQ Global Market System. Are you with me so far? Again, we're in the over-the-counter market. These are over-the-counter securities. The NASDAQ Global Market System lists NASDAQ Global Market Securities. The difference between a NASDAQ Global Market Security, listen to me, watch me carefully, and a NASDAQ issue, which is listed on the NASDAQ systems, are light years away from one another financially. The NASDAQ Global Market Security, for what you're about to hear right now, is the blue chip of the over-the-counter market. Are you with me so far? Yes. In order for a company to be listed in the NASDAQ Global Market System, are you with me so far? It has to be significantly more profitable with respect to sales and earnings of the company that's listed in the NASDAQ system. So you're dealing with a much more profitable company. Are you with me so far? Yeah. You can see five, seven, ten market makers in this stock. That's NASDAQ global market listings. What is the number of market makers in order for NASDAQ listing required? Three. So you have more market makers here. Are you with me so far? Which means what? Are you with me so far? Stay with me on each point. So what does that mean? It means more trading volume. You're dealing with a much more heavily traded market for this particular stock. The company, because it's stronger with respect to sales and earnings, is a more expensive stock. Are you with me so far? Yes. NASDAQ global market stocks are priced seven, Series 7 initially at $5 a share or higher. What about NASDAQ issues? Look at me. $3 a share or higher. So it's a $5 stock. Again, like NASDAQ issues, the NASDAQ global market security may never fall below a dollar a share on the bid. Neither NASDAQ or NASDAQ global market stocks may fall below a dollar a share on the bid. That's their minimum bid test. They can't fall below a dollar a share on the bid. It's initially priced NASDAQ global market securities at $5 a share or higher. Are you with me so far? Yes. You're dealing with greater market makers, greater activity, a stronger market for the stock. And for the overall aforementioned reasons with respect to a stronger level of sales and earnings, the NASDAQ global market security, which is a security that may be globally traded here, only NASDAQ traded. Are you with me so far? Yes. Not necessarily globally traded. It is the blue chip of the over-the-counter market. Are you with me so far? Yes. The biggest system, look at me, of electronic execution in the over-the-counter market, Series 7, is called Super Montage. You want to know why it's called Super Montage? You should know from last night in your pre-review. Because this system will execute up to a maximum Series 7 of 999,999 shares. One share shy of a million. Four, seven, NASDAQ small cap, NASDAQ large cap execution issues, securities. This system right here. One share shy of a million will execute. Wow. I ain't talking that iOS commercial. That's power. Are you with me? Yes. 
This system super montage will execute up to a maximum of one share shy of a million for the execution of NASDAQ small cap and NASDAQ large cap issues in the over-the-counter market. So let's take a look again at over-the-counter systems that facilitate over-the-counter execution for over-the-counter securities. They are the NASDAQ system, the NASDAQ global market system, and super montage. Are you with me so far? Yes. Are you with me so far? Yes. Now we got to talk. Now you got to put your pens down. You got to listen to me. You know, uh, NASDAQ, this system right here, mainframe system in the over-the-counter market that facilitates the execution of NASDAQ securities. Are you with me so far? Yes. Say yes. yes. Good. Just had a birthday not too long ago. Now, before I ask you how old you think the NASDAQ system is, I understand that uh, this system is older than you, or most of you in this room. No question about it. I also know that your Wall Street career is so young that uh, most everything that's in this system was much right here much longer than you were here, are you with me so far? So, but however, that means that in your young Wall Street career, are you with me so far? Yes. These over-the-counter issues, these technology stocks, they've been around forever. At least you would think so, are you with me? Because they're certainly around a lot longer than you. But it might not be what you think. How old is the NASDAQ system of new technology securities? How old is this system? Take a guess. A couple of years? No, we're a little bit older than that. Are you with me so far? I'm sorry. 50? Not quite. Okay. 36 years. You know, it's still older than everybody in the room, I think, almost. Are you with me so far? Yes. Uh, again, a lot longer than your Wall Street career, no question about it. But we have been trading on Wall Street for how many years? A little bit more than 200. Are you with me so far? Okay. So before the NASDAQ system was created to facilitate uh, over-the-counter execution regarding NASDAQ securities, are you with me so far? Yes. Uh, what was going on down here? Where were we buying and selling and trading securities before that system in this over-the-counter market was even created? Uh, all we had were the major exchanges. We had the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, the Chicago Stock Exchange, we had the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, and only later on were the regional exchanges of Boston and Cincinnati and Pacific born. Are you with me? Yes. That's really all we had. So that meant that for more than 200 years, 100 plus, we're buying and selling and trading securities predominantly to listed on the major exchanges. Are you with me so far? Yes. New York Stock Exchange, more than 200 years. Up comes the over-the-counter market. They get born. Are you with me so far? Brand new baby. And the NASD, now new name change known as FINRA, which are the regulators that regulate the over-the-counter market, which we'll get into in a moment, goes up to the SEC and says, SEC, can we talk to you for a minute? Listen, uh, we're a new baby here, the over-the-counter market, NASDAQ system, just born in an industry in the financial capital of the world that's been trading for more than 200 years. And uh, we don't really think it's fair what's been going on. Certainly not fair to us. And the SEC said, well, what do you mean? like the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, they have all the glamour, they have all the listings, and they've been around forever. So the SEC said, well, what can you expect? They were here first. I know, we understand that. But you see, we don't really see how we can compete with the exchange, how we're going to be able to grow into this industry when they have such a dominant mon monopoly on all of the quality listings because they've been down here for more than 157 years. Are you with me so far? Yes. That's why, SEC, we would like you to pass this system called the Consolidated Quotation Service System. I don't want you to write. I know you want to. I don't want you to. I want you to listen to me. Because if you write, you don't listen. So I figured this out really quick. This system consolidates and lists all common stock from the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ all rolled into that system. That system, if the SEC passed it, and they did, and you'll see why in a moment, allows the over-the-counter market, we're in the over-the-counter now, are you with me so far? Yes. To buy and sell stocks in the over-the-counter market through that system that are listed on an exchange. I don't really think you understand the impact of just what I've said. You write up a buy ticket that says to buy 500 shares of IBM. Where is IBM listed? Do you know? No, it's a New York Stock Exchange uh, stock, Dow 30 component, big blue. You want to buy Disney. You want to buy any of those stocks that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Before the over-the-counter market was born, where did you have to go to buy or sell those securities? On the exchange where it's listed, am I right? It's the only location. With the approval and the passage of this system called the Consolidated Quotation Service System, you can write on your ticket right now, buy 500 shares of IBM, 
OTC CQS execution. Your trader sees that. You know what he knows? He knows not to go to the New York Stock Exchange to buy that stock. He knows to buy that stock, IBM, listed on the New York in the over-the-counter market through that system. This system has done what? It has allowed the over-the-counter market to execute listed stocks in the OTC, not on the exchange where they're normally listed. i got to tell you what happened. There was an uproar by the New York Stock Exchange. The New York Stock Exchange got wind of this and said to the SEC, do you think that we're out of our minds down here? We're the oldest exchange in the world. We are the creator of the financial world. Don't you think, SEC, that we here at the New York Stock Exchange would do everything in our way, everything in our power, to stand in your way of not passing that system? If anybody wants to buy or sell stocks that are listed on our exchange, New York Stock Exchange says, they got to come to our exchange to buy them. The American Stock Exchange also concurred. You'll be so far. Yes. The SEC heard this argument pretty clear and told the New York Stock Exchange and told the American Stock Exchange you were allowed to compete and thrive and America was built on capitalism and a consumer-based capitalistic society. We have every intention here of passing that system to allow the over-the-counter market to compete with your exchange. Are you with me so far? Yes. And so for the very first time when the SEC approved the passage in that system it allowed the over-the-counter market to execute listed stocks away from the exchange where they're listed in the over-the-counter market through that system. Are you with me so far? Through the Consolidated Quotation Service System or any ECN which stands for Electronic Communication Network which is a network that executes orders and disseminates and publishes quotes for stocks that are listed on an exchange in the over-the-counter market. You can execute any listed stock away from the exchange where they're listed in the over-the-counter market through these systems. Are you with me so far? Yes. Of course, this is the more significant of the two. The creation of the third marketplace. Hold it, wait a minute now. Third marketplace. What happened to the first two? Did that go over my head? No. We haven't gotten to them yet. The primary market for any security we said when we enrolled is the first marketplace. And tonight we'll see the primary market for equity offerings and how stocks.